This short break from civilization is brought to you by the Ford Bronco. Get back out there. The Ford Bronco. Built wild. Learn more at Ford.com slash Bronco. I have flown. I have sailed. I have moved about this world of ours. And ever in search of the finest of its kind, we bring you the tops in Audio Drama Networks. This is Mutual. The following audio drama is rated PG-13, suggesting that children under the age of 13 should listen accompanied with an adult. Hello, strange world. Welcome to the Aldergate Papers. My name is Adrian Ward, and these singed and crumpled pages are my diary, a record of the final days of my former life. I remember almost nothing of the story they contain, and the more I read, the less I wish to know. There is a shadow over Aldergate University a shadow from which I barely escaped with my life, a shadow into which I must now step once more. And you're coming with me. So, where were we? We left our hero in fine form. Having ventured to the cavernous depths below the Office of Invitation, he now has the information he sought, and is preparing to put it into action. He is well-fed and filled with purpose. In short, things seem to be going rather well. No doubt this happy state of affairs shall continue. This is Day Nine, Part Eight. Yesterday, upon the stair. It is the ninth day of the return to Aldergate. The time and place of writing is the dying end of a November evening, in the private office of the manse of the Vice-Chancellor. We begin. They're still at it, down there. You can hear them. Muted, but unceasing, unrelenting. And you can't get away from it. Can't get it off you. It sticks. Is this what happens at Aldergate now? Or has it always happened, and you've only just woken up to it? <sighs> no. Or overreacting. Yes, certainly you are. You've had a shock, and such a shock. Anyone would feel a bit uncertain. It's nothing to worry about, nothing to think about, really. It's all in good fun. More, all for the sake of art. More, something. It's probably all right. Somehow, in some weird and worrying light, from some strange, unnatural angle. Anyhow, what can you do about it? 
It's not as if you could make them stop. But you do wish they wouldn't howl quite so loudly. No. Louder. You wish they'd howl louder. You can still hear her, over all of it, when she manages to scream. Except... No. No. No, you can't. You can't hear her at all. Surely not. Through all that noise, through the stone and ancient glass, can you hear her? Really? You can hear something. Can you be sure hers is the voice you're hearing? Can you be certain what you hear is anything at all? Not now. Not anymore. Not her voice. Not her voice. Not that voice, or any voice. Perhaps it's just the squeaking of the bats in your belfry. The terrible bats, and the terrible rats, and the cats in the terrible steeple. But they're still out there, in the horrible street. The horrible, horrible people. <sighs> And your hand is bloody killing you. Thankfully. If not for it, you might spin right off this planet and good riddance on a night like this. The pain keeps you tethered down. Pain is real. And a distraction. It makes you focus on your blessings. The little tangibles that aren't stacked against you such as the fact that Sir Reggie hasn't defrosted the manse's freezer in the past decade. You didn't want to dig too deep. He's probably got Tim Leary's head in there, tucked away behind the glaciated fish fingers. <laughs> you just chipped out enough stale snow to pack into a glove, one of the lovely big woolly mitts Bells always wants you to get rid of. She'll get her wish. You're surely ruining the poor thing. Which is you properly snookered, because when they go, it leaves you with only the pewter grey peccaries, which you can't wear over a bandage, and which would make you look like a waiter in any suit you're likely to wear in the next few months. Uh, uh, speaking of which, good show to the salt and lyle. It's holding up remarkably well after the day you've put it through. But you really must reconnect with Baz about that dry cleaner. You need your Chesterfield instanter, and your wardrobe will be running dangerously thin before long. Yes, that's the stuff. Focus on those little enormities, and the problems you can, maybe, actually solve, or at least shunt into a holding pattern. Bad, but not worsening. Like your poor left hand. The ice is helping, certainly. It is helping. But where the pain recedes, it leaves rather an odd sensation behind. A deep, dark, chilly throb, while all the rest of you is toasting nicely before the fire. Meanwhile, this cosy little snuggery of yours is surrounded by the chilly nightmare of whatever the twist is happening out there on the pent. <sighs> and now you're thinking about that again. <laughs> Why not? Adrian Ward thinks of many things, but you needn't be concerned about them, after all. Not if you don't want to. Yes, there is that bright side to the discovery that you're hallucinating more than usual. It gives you carte blanche to dismiss so many of your worries. 
<laughs> to start with, it means there's no monsters in your basement after all. And perhaps no basement, even. Perhaps the door's just decorative. A joke by Sir Reggie. <laughs> That's right, you fellows. Just here off the kitchen. I mean to spread a rumour, you see. Claim I've got a magnificent collection of old wines. Really, I'd never touch anything stronger than orange squash. That's right. Make it look old. Old as the manse itself. But stick a dodgy little electric code lock on the outside to make it look important and weird. <laughs> yes. Why not? The choice is yours to make. How jolly to live in a world where that door never really opened at all. You imagined it, invented all of it, and paf, like that, all your demons of the deep explode into neurodeviant confetti. There are no scuttling things, no whispers from below, no pallid faces floating in the darkness. No. Just poor old Adrian and his poor old broken brain. <sighs> Why not choose to live in that happier world, since you can't trust yourself to tell the difference? <sighs> your fault. You stayed too long at the mercantile, far longer than you ought to have done. But you were feeling so pleased with yourself, and after your brush with hypothermia in the bowels of the Office of Invitation, you were hardly champing at the bit to leave your comfy tent. It was nearly four o'clock when you sallied forth, and the dying glimmer over the western rooftops was more decorative than functional. Winter has come to Watergate in earnest, and brought its teeth along. Brrr. Lesser men would have quailed. Greater men would probably have found themselves a replacement overcoat by this time. You, being you, well, you suffered through it. Hugged your elbows and pressed out into the bitter evening. Cold in the tail, but hot on the trail. You were getting close to Sammy's secret. So close you could taste it. That's what you told yourself, at least, as you legged it for Elden House. Sammy's scheme, the scheme that had brought her back to Watergate, that was the nexus. Oh, she'd kept tight lid on things, covered her track almost too well, so far as you've been able to tell, at least. But somewhere behind those walls of secrecy, either in what she was hiding, or in what she did to hide it, lies the singular point where all the other questions intersect. If it was Black Jack Hoborn who killed her, the partners she left behind are as good a bet as any for how you'll prove it for all the good that could do. And if not, well, all the more important that you learn what they know. <sighs> yes, the secret may hide the murder, and the murder may lead you to the secret. Priorities, self, there are bigger things. Your own little plot to resurrect Project Sybil relies on your getting access to Midwinter Hill, which is proving distractingly difficult. But Sammy, who must have been working along similar lines, doesn't seem even to have tried. She'd found a new way, a new angle of attack. And you can think of no better way to honor her memory and her work than to pillage it for all it's worth. <laughs> it does speak rather well of you, doesn't it? That your private agenda should align so perfectly with your public duty. With a heart so pure, your strength ought to be as the strength of ten. 
And yet, the voice of weakness murmured a pretty convincing case in your ear as you fought a biting headwind down Queen's Parade. Said you ought to chuck the evening's program entirely and just go home. Think of safety, weakness whispered. You are hunted by a cunning killer. Think you are, at least. You cannot avenge Sammy's death if you follow her on the next boat. Fie, you countered. Consider strategy. A moving target is more easily missed. But think of duty, weakness hissed as you turned in between Empress and Dolora and cut down Regent's Passage. Haven't you got vice-chancellering to do? Your inbox groans with unanswered correspondence, which you can best address from the comfort of home and hearth. Twice fire, you replied, nipping down Bally Alley. Consider justice. What of duty to friendship and to the law? As for the university, having unsolved murders lying about the place can hardly be doing much good for the fabric of Aldergate life. Powerful words, if you do say so yourself, but they did not end the argument. Consider your health, weakness wheedled as you stepped out onto the pentangle and were buffeted by a chilling gust of November's breath. You have endured a great deal these past few days, falling off ladders and through trap doors and into puddles of ick, nearly starving, nearly freezing, nearly severing your own left hand, and all of it on no sleep to speak of. No wonder your poor brain is shaking itself to pieces. Take heed. Exercise a bit of self-care. You will be no good to anyone if you break yourself any further. In retrospect, weakness may have had a point with that one, and ought probably to have prevailed. Debate was cut short at that point, however, by distraction. Squiggle had returned. Uh, uh, the Aldergate players, rather. But no, no, they're Squiggle as far as you're concerned. They embody their symbol to a nicety, oddly elaborate, needlessly cryptic, and seemingly everywhere. Yes. That bloody squiggle mark of theirs really has become a sort of background radiation. You don't even notice it any more. Posters plastered across every surface that'll take them. Not just the Tempire, they're all over Sultan House and the Occam Arcade as well. You never bothered pulling down the one you found on the manse's front door that first morning, and just as well... It's now entirely obscured by the five others that have been slapped up over it. <laughs> Those masked ones. Not the actors, not Wink and Three-Face and so on. Just those silent drones, white faces bobbing in the last rays of the dying day. And gave you a jilt of déjà vu. Just like when you first got back to Aldergate, they were mucking about in the middle of the pent, setting up that stage of theirs. Against your will, you found yourself moderately interested in the goings-on. The drones' masks are all identical, but each has its own little clockwork role in their dramatic mechanism. This one carries the planks, that one sets them into place, this one sets the torches in their stakes around the platform. That one does a little hand-jive ritual and lights them. One, a tall and rather fragile-looking spectre, stalked through the crowd that had started to assemble. Not a small crowd, either, even at that point. What sort of maniac turns out for open-air theatre in this weather? Oh, what a question. You know precisely what sort of maniac. You can glance out the window if you need a reminder. You can still hear... 
No, no. Anyhow, you had work to do. Had to go find Gabriel Keller, after all. Couldn't be bothered to engage with the masked one's nonsense. You were so very indifferent to the squiggle shenanigans, in fact, that, instead of skirting round like any sensible person would have, you ploughed right through the thick of the crowd, with your best too busy for this muck stride. <sighs> That's how they got you. That tall mask. You tried to avoid it, but striding purposefully through a milling crowd turns one into a sort of human pachinko ball, and fortune bounced you along on what turned out to be a collision course. Nearly planted your face in the silly git's sunken chest. And, oh, you would have been properly cross with it for occupying perfectly good space like that, but it never gave you the chance. It took you by the cuff, ever so gently, and pressed something into your hand, and then melted back into the twilight. It was so soft, so timid about it, almost apologetic. Really, you were entirely nonplussed. You examined the crumpled scrap of paper you'd been given, half expecting it to be a note with check boxes. Do you like me? Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> no. No, you do not. Not that masked one in particular, not the other masked ones in general. And you do not like that squiggle. Because, of course, that's what was on the paper. Only this and nothing more. Well, you tore it up and tossed it away, and then you... Hold up. You most certainly did not. Now, why would you write that you tore up that piece of paper? You did nothing of the kind. That is odd, self. An odd thing to do, so don't do it. You've hit your quota for new odd behaviors today. <sighs> Where were you? The pen. The paper. Well, you did get rid of it, anyhow. Presumably. Don't quite recall. Not that it matters. You haven't got it now. Ugh. <sighs> The point is, you do not care for that squiggle. It annoys you. And you are further annoyed by the fact that it annoys you. Why do you let it? It's a nuisance, but you tolerate far worse with better grace. And as viral marketing goes, it's hardly the worst effort you've seen. Not bad for a bunch of actors flogging a show. Suppose, with all the real mysteries you've got riding you, you're a bit unsympathetic towards the gratuitous creation of another. <sighs> Something's odd. Did you... Did you go on walkabout, there in the crowd? You don't think so. If you did, you didn't walk far. But the sun had well and truly set by the time you disentangled yourself from that pack of foolishness. You had been heading for Elden House's Pentwood Gate, but a floating orange spark warned you off. The ember of a cigarette. It was Lobanova, of all people, Sir Abdul's successor, leaning against the gate and watching the to-do in ripped jeans and a t-shirt, no less, probably pining for the steps of Siberia. Well, you recalled the awkwardness of your last meeting and were in no condition for a repeat performance, so you took the coward's way out, down Lizzie Alley, then back along the river walk to the Prometheus Gate. Yes, hello, Promir. Been a while. Old fellow looks just as he always has, still standing proudly as Eldon's left and gatepost, forever reaching out to the carved pillar of twining human bodies that forms the other half of the archway. 
You always felt tremendous empathy for the poor doomed titan. His weathered marble face wears the haunted expression of a chap who fully understands what he's getting himself into. <laughs> Today he was passing off an umbrella. Promy always starts the semester by extending the torch of knowledge, but it never takes more than a day or two for some daring Eldonian to accept the gift on humanity's behalf and replace it with something else. The last time you passed through, the rebel godling was bestowing a bicycle pump, which your striving species appeared to covet no less fervently. <laughs> Thus returned Adrian Ward to Elden House. You didn't recognize the gatehouse porter. Not that you would have expected to, but you did recognize his name tag. Peg just like in your day. No family resemblance that you could make out. This new chap's Greek, and the other chap was Ghanaian. Ah, well, who are you to fathom the dynastic diaspora of the House of Peg? Anyhow, this reigning Peg pointed you to sweet 503. In South Hall, just like you are, and a floor above. Truly a proper homecoming. And still the same old Soha. You always suspected that the place hadn't changed much in the five hundred years since it stopped being a glorified prison for the mentally ill. The past fifteen years certainly haven't left much impression. No, no, you're wrong about that. The staircases are much longer now than they were when you were fifteen. You took the first three flights at a sprint to warm up, then paused on the next landing to wish you hadn't. You breathed a bit, and toyed with the notion of paying a visit to old sweet 406. Sentimental? Certainly. Silly? Perhaps. A reprieve from any immediate further stair-climbing? Well... <sighs> And, as you dithered, the voices started. Voice. Not voices, just the one voice. But unfortunately, that distinction does not impress the diagnostic criteria. You heard it. It wasn't imagination, or daydreaming, or wool-gathering. Not this time. It was a voice, and you heard it, you experienced it, clearly and distinctly. And now you've asked the internet about it, and the verdict is not what you would categorize as tidings of great joy. Of course, you've always had a few little kinks along those lines, your little family of figments. The musical egg and the trapped thing have been with you since forever. Mr. Jellyface, too, though he may just be a co-symptom of your walkabouts. Still, they're different. They don't do any harm, and they've got tenure. This new voice is... well... You have got one straw to cling to. That's not much of one. Apparently, auditory hallucinations do not necessarily indicate schizophrenia. Having said that, taken together with the rest of the figment crew, and your accelerating habit of disappearing unexpectedly, well, things do tend rather to glance meaningfully in that direction. But it's not certain. There are other things that can start a chap hearing voices. Emotional trauma, for instance. And suppose you really did have something buried deep down inside, some dreadful secret that your mind has spent years and years coating in nacreous layers to protect you. Well, all of a sudden you're back in the haunts of your youth, going up your old stairs, 
heading for your old room. Imagine all those mental dams disintegrating before a flood of suppressed memories. That's the sort of thing that could knock a chap for a paracusial loop, couldn't it? Perhaps. Hope springs eternal. Anyhow, according to Dr. Wikipedia, voices in heads can speak the hallucinator's thoughts, or narrate his actions, or sometimes they just argue amongst themselves. Seems you've got that last variety. True to your usual form, however, you can't even go mad properly. You've been shortchanged. Your buggy brain only lets you in on half the conversation. Where are you? A pause. Hello? Another pause. A long one. Then. Look, if you won't talk to me, just listen. You have to come back. You don't understand. It's important. I wouldn't ask if it weren't important. Only this, and nothing more. Rather dull, eh? So commonplace, in fact, that you've no way of knowing if it's happened to you before. In a crowded room, or on a busy street, you'd have tuned it out entirely. Just a snippet of some stranger's meaningless conversation. Funny, isn't it? No. It isn't funny, because the voice in your head isn't a stranger. It's Parata. Well then, people say believe half of what you see, son, and none of what you hear. Our poor hero must consider what to trust and what to fear. Which of the sounds and sights and suspicions that haunt him are real? Which are merely daggers of the mind? We shall just have to see, shan't we? Join me every second Sunday for a fresh episode of The Aldergate Papers. Right now, however, you must help me help myself. Do please find the Aldergate Papers on Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review. And spread the word, won't you? Point your friends to thealdergatepapers.com. Until next time, I am and shall remain your humble servant, Adrian Ward. Thank you for listening to Tuesday Terror right here on the Mutual Audio Network. Please consider subscribing to other days of the Mutual feeds, including Monday Matinee for classic live and theatrical audio plays, Wednesday Wonders, our science fiction and fantasy magazine, Thursday Thrillers for action, adventure, mystery, and crime drama, Friday Follies, our end-of-the-week comedy series, the Saturday Story Circle for kids and family alike, and Sunday Showcase, bringing you the very newest in audio releases for the week from our United Artists of Audio, right here on the Mutual Audio Network. The Mutual Audio Network. Listening and imagining together.